So this lecture, I'm going to talk about the technological singularity explained and promoted. Um, so it's a brief introduction to what the technological singularity is and some ideas of how could we bring this to the general public. What would be uh, logical uh, targets to shoot for, how many people we might reach, and how should we reach them. Because the reason that the word singularity is not in the name of the course is that most people have no idea what that word means. And you can't have a course name that nobody knows what the word means. So that's why we have named the course Technology and the Future of Medicine. So uh, in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, a world is confronted that's much more organic than, than expected. And no matter what your background, the cool thing about that book is everybody know, knows it. There's almost no one on the planet who's not been exposed to Alice in Wonderland. And in this uh, technology intense uh, world that we live in, you know that one of the best uh, iPad apps now is the uh, Alice in Wonderland book, which is wonderfully animated and, and that sort of thing. So luckily, it's an idea that you can bring and everybody in the audience knows something about it. Now, you remember the croquet game, and the croquet game, the main difficulty Alice had was in managing her flamingos. So the mallet is a flamingo, and the ball is a hedgehog. With all the imprecision that you would have with both the mallet and the ball constantly writhing around and trying to do different things from what you want them to do, a really imprecise world. We face a world exactly the opposite of that. The technological singularity in that we face a world that's much less organic than expected, very precise, and that could develop without us in it. Maybe that world will not require human beings. And so that's really the challenge that we're looking at. So in, in, in that sense, it's the complete opposite of down the ra rabbit hole and, and the world that you learn about in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Now, I've been talking a lot about those sorts of risks in, in many forums. I, I, I have videos for the Lifeboat uh, Foundation talking about uh, existential risks. I've talked about these things on TV and so on, and also about the AI physician. I sent you a link uh, about the idea of the uh, AI physician uh, X Prize. There's now, I think, a $7 million prize for the person who comes up with something like the Star Trek tricorder that can diagnose 30 different diseases and, and there, there are specs for what you need to do, what your tricorder needs to be able to do to win that money. It's a very interesting thing, these uh, X Prizes. It's completely undemocratic in that the people who don't win don't get anything, right? It's not like a second and third and fourth prize. Just the, the one person gets the big prize. But it's been shown to be a highly uh, uh, effective way to get things done in science. It's surprising that it would work. But you know, for instance, with the um, uh, autonomous car, that the same thing worked. There, were, there was a prize given, and there, there were some spectacular successes of cars that could navigate themselves in the desert. And in your future, there will be a, very soon a time when you see a lot of cars on the highway that don't have anybody inside uh, driving them. And that is the consequence of a successful uh, uh, X Prize. So, whereas we might all embrace, you know, democracy as, as a way to do most things, this is one instance where a completely undemocratic uh, uh, approach seems to uh, accomplish something. Now, we talked last time about the two things that occurred in 
February, which kind of changed the world. And one is uh, Watson's win on Jeopardy, and the other was the technological sing singularity appearing on the cover of Time magazine. And the uh, analogy for Watson is really Hal in the movie 2001. Now, I don't know how many of you remember that movie, but your sentiment about Hal changes a lot. Um, because in the beginning, Hal is a really good guy and helpful and it's impressive, all, all the things that artificial intelligence can do. It's only when Hal turns on the human beings and uh, begins to kill them off one by one that your sentiments change. So, um, my writing partner, uh, Nikki Olson, and I have always been fans of Hal, and we have a Hal clock. But it's not the uh, homicidal Hal that we're fans of. It's, it's the earlier version in the first part of the movie. And this clock, which was in my office for, for a long time, is now in uh, Nikki Olson's uh, uh, home office, and it's part of what inspires us writing the book and preparing this course. And so the HAL clock uh, helps to inspire the book uh, that we are writing for the general public on the technological sing singularity and helps provide the proper spirit for the planning of this course. Um, the book is expected to be completed this year, uh, 2012, so we're basically writing it as we're teaching this course to the extent that you interact with us, you, you are also helping us with, with the writing of that book, and also the writing of the book helps to inform the lectures. So many of the ideas in the lectures come directly from what we're writing in the book. So you might imagine that, you know, Alice in Wonderland and the uh, croquet game and everything is in the book and, and is in the lecture. So we can't beat, about, beat around the bush forever. We have to talk about what the technological singularity is. That's what this course is about, so we have to begin talking about what it really is. And so it is that point in time where Machines are smarter than we are. And when that point is reached then, machines control the future agenda of the world. And the only way then that we can understand what's going on or that we can partly have some influence over what's happening in the world is by merging with machines in some way. And um, so the machines will get much smarter than we are. We're not just talking about machines with an effective IQ of 200 or something. We're talking about the difference between a human being and a grasshopper. If you think of the, the life of a grasshopper versus your life, there's almost no comparison, right? That's what it, it, it will be like because there will be these rapid runaway cycles of self-improvement. Once the machine is sufficiently intelligent, then it's going to know how to replicate itself, know how to become much more intelligent. So the gulf between the native human intelligence and machine intelligence will become very wide. That then means we have great uncertainty today about what things will be like then. It's like the black hole in physics and the uh, uh, event horizon as you approach the black hole. So that's where the word singularity comes from. It's a term from physics and it ideally should mean it's one thing. It only happens once. It's not like every time you wake up or something. Um, but a, a, as we'll talk about, the problem with any idea going mainstream is once it's adopted by mainstream human beings and they start to kind of put their own ideas 
into it and it becomes a bit blurred. And as you'll see, although I think ideally the technological singularity should be a precise idea and we should maintain it that way, there are a lot of people now who are thinking about it in a much more vague and imprecise way. It, it exists now in many flavors, that's for sure. And the Singularity University, where I took the nine-day uh, executive course, um, really represents all those various uh, uh, approaches. You, you can find them all there. And you get a broad and balanced uh, education there for that reason. So the idea of the technological singularity begins to lose meaning entirely if we say it's already occurred. If we say that the invention of farming was a singularity and the atom bomb was a singularity and the internet was and so on, and then there are even people saying that when, when they wake up in the morning, every morning, that's a sing singularity when they get a new cell phone, you know. So we can't really control the way the word is used, but ideally, we at least in this course should continue to use it in a rigorous way. It is something in the future, it hasn't happened yet. And if it is something in the future and if it ha hasn't happened yet, then we still need to define it further. Is it an event? Is it a process? Is it slow? Is it fast? Is it a hard takeoff? Is it a soft takeoff? And is there any significance to the year 2045? The time cover in February 2011 had that date on the cover, which is the date that Ray Kurzweil predicts is when the technological singularity will happen. Uh, how precise is that? Is that realistic? Does it make sense to pick a date? Uh, the, these are all questions that we might uh, debate in this course. There are three main schools of belief about the technological singularity. These are the accelerating change school, the Event Horizon School and the Intelligence Explosion School. And then within each of these, there are various ways in which the uh, sing singularity might be reached. So four paths. And these are fairly obvious if you think about them in terms of collaboration between us and machines and whether the Sing singularity is all machines or all us, right? So the first is the idea that a machine creates, there, there is created in a machine an artificial intelligence that greatly exceeds human intelligence. So that's the first path. The second path is a human computer interface that by computer enhancement of human beings allows humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent. This is sort of the cyborgian or cybernetic singularity. The third type, probably the least likely, is to improve biology itself so that we as biological beings become very, very smart without any machines, basically. And then the fourth way is basically where the internet wakes up. So one day you find that the internet's talking to you and so on. You know, there, there already is in the internet uh, loss of packets, various accidental things that happen. It wouldn't take much to, to start to see evidence for some life uh, independent life on the internet. So that the fourth way is building a large computer network in which beyond human intelligence emerges. All of these different variations on the belief in this singularity are reflected in the courses at the Singularity University. Now, those of you who are in, 
of an age where you might consider a graduate studies program, there, there is a nine-week summer program there. And Shana Pandya, who, who is a, a medical student now who will teach in this course um, later on, she, she took that course. So I've taken the nine-day course. She's taken the nine-week course. But it's an experience unlike any other in life in that when it's over formally, it starts to really grow because you meet all these other people and the contacts just keep going and you go back for the reunion and so on. So really, as opposed to all other experiences in life, where when the experience ends, it sort of tails off and then you forget most of it and that's it. This really begins when the formal part of it ends <laughs> because it just grows and grows and grows from that. So it's a really cool experience. It takes off on kind of an, an exponential curve of its own. Now, if you begin talking with people about this area of the technological singularity, you meet people arguing with Ray Kurzweil's views. And the thing they usually don't take into account, if you think the way you yourself construct an argument, you don't want to make things too hard, right? So you assume the person you're arguing with, who isn't there anyway, is fairly narrow views, narrow, well-defined views. And you're opposed to those, so then you're telling people why you don't agree with those views. But in Ray Kurzweil's case, you have to consider this that he published a book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, in 1999. And everything he's done since then has basically been to successfully argue with the critics of that book. So he's working full time on all these various alternative ideas that are presented to him and all the arguments and all the feedback that he got for this, that book. And in fact, this book came about simply because in 2005, he wrote down what he had been working on as all the counter arguments, the people's criticism of his 1999 book. So the chances that you can spend a few minutes and come up with a really winning, um, you know, opposing idea against Ray Kurzweil when he's working full time, really, for the past 12 years on this. And he's amazingly flexible. He's aware of all the various alternative theories out there. And he's reachable. So if you write to him and say, well, you know, I don't really believe what you say, and blah, blah, blah. He will not only respond to you, but he probably knows more about this question you've posed to him than you do. He knows some other facets because he's heard this question before. So he'll send you back a response that partly says, yes, you're right, that, that's true, but have you thought about this? So it, it's unlikely that although in many coffee, uh, house conversations and late night parties and so on, you'll hear people railing against him. It's unlikely that what they're railing against, that narrow view, would really be anything similar to what would happen if you put the same question to him and, and say, you know, uh, uh, what do you think about that? And I've seen that happen uh, very often. And, and I've also seen people who suddenly realized he is reachable, but they don't have their arguments well enough <laughs> formulated to actually put them to him. Okay, so that's the first part. I'm just, I told you about the technological sing singularity just very briefly, and now I want to talk about promoting these ideas to the general public, because most people don't know about this stuff. Most people are not aware that it was on the cover of Time Magazine in February 2011, or if they saw it there, they didn't read it, you know, that, that's, and, and the win on Jeopardy, only some people are really completely aware of that and they have no idea what it means and they haven't really thought it through. So 
there's a great need to capture the imagination of the general public and to get them really thinking about this because this is going to be the major influence over what the future is like. So it would be a lot better to be prepared for it and to help shape it in a positive way. For instance, take the whole issue of distraction, multitasking. You all know that young people and even people like me spend a lot of time doing many things at the same time. Every for formal study of that shows that human beings perform less well when they multitask, but we're all multitasking more and more. Well, what's wrong with this picture? It's not as simple as it seems. If you know multiple languages, then you actually multitask much better than your friends who only know a single language. If, if, if you're young and you grew up with you know, computers in the house, you actually uh, multitask better than somebody who, who hasn't had that uh, upbringing. But if you think about this whole question about devices distracting us and whether that's good or bad or whether that's simply enhancing our human capability, it's not something where the answer is known, it's something where we can determine what that answer is. That with proper study and proper you know, initiatives in the right direction, we could make sure that the co-evolution of humans and machines work in, works in a way that benefits uh, human beings. That when AI is, when general AI is created, that it's friendly to us. So <laughs> all these sorts of things. So we need the general public to be thinking about that. How are we going to do this? So we have the idea of a new holiday. Ben Gertzel, who's an AI researcher, came up with the idea of Future Day. Um, all of our holidays at the moment commemorate something in the past. Why not have one that uh, commemorates something in the future? And Future Day will only be successful if it is a product of broad dialogue within society that involves all stakeholders. Maybe all of you believe in a linear future, but there's a large part of the world that doesn't believe in a linear future. They believe in a cyclical future or in karma that extends seven generations back and seven generations forward. So what happens to you may be something that's a consequence of some mistake that your great-great-grandfather made or mistakes that you make could impact, you know, four or five generations. Yeah, there, there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about the future. If we're going to have a holiday, future day, it has to incorporate everybody's ideas about the future, including the cyclical future, the future with karma, and all, all this sort of thing, not just the kind of Western linear future. How many people should we try to reach with this idea? Well, in the U.S. alone, there are 16 million people regularly watching the Big Bang Theory. And worldwide, it's about 30 million. If you think about the Big Bang Theory and what would interest somebody in watching it, it's probably exactly the same things that actually interest us about these serious subjects we're talking about today. The only thing is the Big Bang Theory is never serious about anything. So you can't learn any science from the Big Bang Theory. You can only be exposed to the kind of what ideas are maybe out there in a kind of secondary way. But there was a specific episode on the technological singularity on the Big Bang Theory on October 1st, 2010. Here are some shots. You can see the word singularity with a, with a circle around it there. And you can, if you wish, you can go back and watch this episode, of course, and so on. It's kind of cool in that Woz, the co-founder of uh, Apple, was um, on that show. Um, but I think that it, it, it's not unreasonable to think that we could ultimately reach 16 to uh, 30 million people with this idea if we do it properly. So a, a new holiday, what does it need to have? 
needs to have visuals, it needs to have tapestry, it needs to have ceremony, it needs to have auditory things that you remember. It needs to engage all your senses in a new way that's different from everything else in your life. Only then would a new holiday succeed. I don't know how many of you know about the Holy Festival, but um, this is something that in culture of the US and Canada, there's really nothing like it as far as I know. It's nothing remotely like it. So during the Holy Festival, there are all these brightly colored pigments. And a part of the ceremony of the festival is to spray, to sprinkle these pigments on all the people around you. This is all the people. So if you have a, a janitor who, who you sometimes see, who you never talk to because your status and his are very far apart and, you know, there's nothing. But he, you'd be sprinkling pigment on him. If there's a corporate CEO who thinks you're really unimportant, who walks in the same street, well, you'd be sprinkling pigment on, it, 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 it makes everybody the same. The, 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 the society is not differentiated into different classes with this uh, holiday. Originally, those pigments all came from plants and then were non-toxic. And that was really cool, but it's really hard to find brightly colored pigments from plants. So of course, in the modern world, a lot of those pigments now come from paint factories and they're highly toxic. And so from my point of view as a physician, it's really quite interesting. The skin disease, eye disease, lung disease, all of the terrible things that can happen as a consequence of these brightly colored pigments. So, so, so it's not something that's completely benign or without any side effects. But visually, it is so entrancing. Just look at these pictures and imagine your own life. You have never encountered well, maybe two of you, but the rest of you have never encountered anything remotely like this. And you, you can imagine how memorable something like this would be. You, you've never been in a scene as colorful as that. You, you, there's nothing you've ever done that's similar to, to that. Even, uh, you know, day glow lights, fluorescent stuff and nightclubs and so on, doesn't come even close to this. I'm not saying that we, this is what we need for future day. I'm saying we need something that people will find dramatic, that they will say, yes, this is really different. My goodness, I never th thought this was possible. Now, how else might you be able to do that? Well, this is a poem on my uh, Facebook page. I don't know how many of you have visited my Facebook page. It has always been the only poem on that page. And it, it is visually very rich, just as you might you know, imagine um, the, those pigments are. Maybe we should develop a Crayola bomb as our next secret weapon a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb. And every time a crisis developed, we would launch one, it would explode high in the air, explode softly, and send thousands, millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to earth boxes of Crayolas, and we wouldn't go cheap either. Boxes of 64 with a sharpener built right in, with silver and gold and copper, magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And the people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. So that gives you the same sort of visual idea of these bright pigments and doing something unusual with them. Some of you may be familiar with the artificial intelligence vacuum cleaner, Roomba. But did you know if you do a time-lapse photograph of your Roomba, it looks like this. It's quite visually intriguing with many different colors. So that's um, 
Another high-tech way to, to have similar visuals with no toxicity at all. Um, what else could we do? Well, there are hot air balloons. Uh, you, you can find hot air balloon f festivals that are as visually entrancing as holy and as the Crayola bomb idea. Somehow we need to maintain the human interaction while making whatever we do safe. If we're going to start something new, it should be somehow safe. Should it be visual only? No, no, it, it must have more than that. What about poetry and song? Well, you can probably think of a thousand different songs. This was one that came to mind, uh, the windmill of your mind. Uh, Windmills of Your Mind, by uh, Dusty Springfield. Round like the circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever-spinning reel. Like a snowball down a mountain or a carnival balloon, like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon. Like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face, the world is like an apple, whirling silently in space, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Now to some of you that's highly meaningful and inspiring, to others of you it's completely boring, something about time, blah, blah, blah. That's because we're not an inbred species. If we were inbred like lab rats, we'd all like the same music, it would be very boring, right? So we, we have to spread across this, the Spectrum. If we're going to capture the imagination of the general public, we need to somehow capture the people on the edges too, not just the people in the, not just the people listening to, uh, uh, you know, Hot 107 here, but everybody else as well. So, um, some some of you may think sometimes about. Uh, Strawberries, you probably can't get them here at this time of the year. In my training in kidney pathology, I learned uh, uh, immunofluorescence in Paris in the summer. And in 1975, I kind of lived on str strawberries. It's a very beautiful way to live. It's very short lived because strawberries don't last very long. You can get them almost there on every street corner in Paris, but you have to eat them quickly because, you know, they're not very good a few days later. And so, you know, the Beatles song, Strawberry Fields Forever, that's kind of a, a contradiction, eh? Because <laughs> strawberries is one of the most short lived effervescent thing we can think of. So may, maybe that could also somehow, that this idea about time, about living in the moment, about planning for the future, all, all those sorts of things. We probably need to bring those ideas together if we're going to create a new holiday, future day. What is the status of this holiday? Well, Ben Goertzel suggested it. I, so far in the world, have been the main person talking about it. And so you in this course have some, you know, ability to influence whether or not this happens. If you think it's a completely stupid I idea, that, that's fine. If you kind of like it or can think of some other way, maybe it shouldn't be a new holiday, it should be in something entirely different that would connect with the general public. So they'd sit up and take notice and say, hey, you know, I never really realized about this singularity thing and, you know, exponential change and machines being smarter than we are and the fact that we can, we're not passive victims of the future. We can, we can influence this. We can shape the future. And that's what, it, what I'm trying to reach people and, and to get them thinking about. So, uh, ladies and Gentlemen, that, that, that ends the formal lecture today, and I, I, I'd be happy to have you discuss and to take any questions that may come to mind.